The United Arab Emirates is ending a military training program in Somalia and closing a big hospital there. This comes in the wake of a growing dispute between the two countries. But why are the UAE and other regional nations interested in Somalia? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. Somalia has been in conflict for much of the last 25 years, but this Horn of African nation has been showing signs of recovering. And that's provoked interest from many regional countries, including the United Arab Emirates. This Gulf nation has been conducting a military training programme and running a hospital in the capital, Mogadishu. But the UAE's government has now abruptly ended its involvement on both those fronts after a series of recent diplomatic disagreements. We'll bring in our guests in just a moment. But first, let's set up today's discussion with our correspondent, Mohamed Adou. The UAE-run Sheikh Zayed Hospital in Mogadishu now closed to the public. Staff there say they received orders to stop operations indefinitely. The facility offered treatment mainly to poor and displaced people in the Somali capital. Medical workers also performed life-saving surgery on those injured in Mogadishu's frequent car bomb attacks. This is basically a punishment for the people of Somalia for simply defending their sovereignty. If the UAE had opened the hospital for humanitarian purposes, they would not have closed it. Residents of Mogadishu have been reacting to the news. Humanitarian aid should never be politicized. What the UAE has done is shameful. Somalia is a free country. We might be weak today, but we don't want their aid that comes with strings attached. Relations between Mogadishu and Abu Dhabi have been frosty since June last year when Mogadishu resisted pressure from the UAE and Saudi Arabia to cut ties with Qatar and join the blockade they imposed on it. In March, Somalia banned UAE's Dubai Ports World from doing business in the country after it annulled an agreement the company had entered into with Ethiopia and Somaliland for the management of Berbera Port in the breakaway enclave. Last week, Somalia intercepted a plane chartered by UAE diplomats and confiscated almost $10 million in cash, saying it would investigate the intended purpose of the funds. On Monday, security forces in northeast Somalia's Puntland prevented another UAE plane from leaving Bosaso Airport after Emirati military trainers refused to hand over their luggage to be searched. It really looks like a dispute that nobody can win. Somalia is a, is a very um, a poor country. It's in a post-conflict reconstruction phase. It needs to focus on rebuilding and developing internally, um, not to be bogged down in these kinds of of disputes. And in the latest sign of a further breakdown in relations, both countries have ended a military cooperation program that began in 2014, in which the UAE trained, equipped, and paid the salaries of hundreds of Somali troops. Mohamed Ado Al Jazeera. Okay, let's take a closer look now at some of the foreign countries involved in Somalia. Well, the United Arab Emirates has been training Somali soldiers since 2014 as part of an effort by the African Union to defeat al-Shabaab and ISIL. Turkey has been one of the biggest investors in Somalia, also drawing attention to the humanitarian crisis there. The president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, was the first foreign leader in recent years to visit the country in 2011. Arab states also play a role in influencing and supporting Somalia, but none have as big an impact as Qatar, a strong ally of Turkey. OK, let's get going with our guests. Joining us from Washington is Abdullahi Halaki, a Horn of Africa analyst. And in Nairobi, joining us on Skype is Muhammad Ali. He is the Somalia country director at ADESCO. That's a, uh, the ADESCO organization. Welcome to you both. Muhammad Ali, just give us a brief sense of the backstory to these current tensions. Well, uh, 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 I, I think um, it's an issue of... Uh, and linking humanitarian aids with politics. That's the way I will, I, I, uh, that's my take, and that shouldn't have happened. I think um, and the services that are provided by, uh, through humanitarian services are critical services that are life-saving 
And um, I think this is one of the biggest problem and or decisions that uh, the UAE has made in terms of cutting funding for a life-saving uh, hospital. Abdullahi Halaki, when it comes to how they were making a value judgment on this relationship, not just suspending a hospital's operation, but closing it down. That's 300 people a day in need of hospitalization. If they were to come back from this, they're not giving themselves the wriggle room to come back from this. I think I, uh, I want to step back a little bit and just provide a, you know, a context within which all these things are taking place. I mean, over the last few years, Africa uh, you know, has been seen as the next frontier. And for a while, a lot of people are paying attention to what was going on between the United States and China, who is giving more money, aid money, who is building more roads and hospitals and, and, and such. But quietly, under the radar, you know, at the second tire, you'd see groups like UAE, Qatari, Saudi Arabia, um, and Turkey, who have been providing some of this critical, you know, uh, humanitarian aid, be it hospitals, schools, and all manner of support. But, you know, after the, you know, the, the, the tension between Saudi Arabia, UAE on one side, and Qatari on the other side, these tensions started boiling over. And, and, and it's very, very important to highlight that a lot of it for the people in the Horn of Africa is playing out in Somalia for now. Uh, although, you know, after Eritrea supported, you know, sided rather with the, the Saudis, um, uh, the Qataris uh, withdrew some of their, you know, uh, some of their uh, forces uh, from a very critical area uh, along the coast that it shares with, um, with, with, with Djibouti. And Eritrea moved very quickly once the Qataris moved away. So, like, to your point, though, um, the reality is there are no free lunches in this uh, in the international arena. So what will happen is another player will come in. But for UAE, I think this uh, will be fairly critical because they have got interest along the uh, in the port of Berbera, which is uh, you know semi-autonomous state within Somalia, and the Somali government has said that is not going to happen. So it's not going just to affect the relationship in uh, in the in, in the humanitarian arena, but it will also have ripple effect. Can I just get you to back up a second? When you say another player will come in, another player will come in from where to do what and how well financed will that new player be? I mean, we, I mean the Horn of Africa, I mean, it's, it's a very critical area. And let's not, let's not beat around the bush. And the reason as to why UAE in most part is there is to counter the growing, growing influence of Qataris and, um, and, uh, and uh, Turkey. Uh, part of the part of the deal was also trying to fight, you know, the war in Yemen uh, from from that part of the world. Never mind, you know, some of these African countries contributing troops uh, in the fight in Yemen, where Saudi Arabia and UAE are on one side. So, in terms of new players uh, or old players that are already there, you know, raising how much they will support. Um, the, 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 the two ideal candidates here are Turkey as well as um, Qatari that will say, OK, we will give more okay. aid, we'll support the opening of the Understood. hospital. Understood. Thank you for that clarity and that prediction. We've now been joined here on Inside Story from Mogadishu by Mohamed Sire. He's a political and security analyst. Mohamed Sire, just, just nail down one thing for me. <laughs> um, it occurs to me here the relationship started going south when somebody turned up on a plane with 9.6 million dollars, it's difficult to get to the heart of where that money came from and what it was going to be used for. In Mogadishu, what's the sense there as to where that cash was destined? Well, we have a different kind of a point of uh, uh, different accounts. Uh, we've heard from uh, the government that uh, there's a bit of a um, double speak. We've heard from uh, the uh, CDF, uh, the highest ranking uh, army officer, just saying that we were aware of uh, the, where the money came from, but also uh, the, the uh, uh, Villa Somalia or the, the federal government uh, of Somalia uh, not really said that they weren't really sure, they, won't be, they weren't informed of uh, the money, uh, the amount of the money and, and the purpose uh, of the money where it was intended. Um, the reaction here in Mogadishu is quite mixed. Uh, people are really confused on, on this. We've heard very recently uh, the, uh, 
the president of uh, Puntland, uh, President Gass, um, uh, held a press conference uh, to uh, made it known to everyone that they welcome the, the support of UAE and the part of the money was intended uh, for um, army uh, or, or, or soldiers uh, that uh, UAE funds and trains in, in Puntulun. Um, the UAE, probably understandable, is quite upset in that. Uh, there was a, uh, they, they claimed uh, some sort of a, a diplomatic pr protocol being violated, but the, the Somali government doesn't see that. They, okay. uh, you have to also remember this came at the time, sorry, this also came at a time where there was a tension, a political tension in the country. Understood. Let's bring in Mohammed Ali. Mohammed Ali, on that point of uh, people, I guess, wanting dual outcomes here, the UAE had agreed to train military forces in Somaliland, but had also agreed to fund this hospital. What is it about the UAE's thinking that made them believe they could do both of those things? Well, I, I, I frankly speaking, I, I don't know what, what they're thinking, but um, my perspective as a humanitarian pr practitioner, the question I'm asking myself is, um, who is who is most affected by this decision? And I think that is uh, a central conversation that we should have today, because I think politics aside, and we're talking of uh, a significant and uh, number of people and uh, whose lifelines uh, are being cut as a result of uh, withdrawing support. And I know Halake had said earlier there will be another player coming in, and, and that's and, uh, possible, and, uh, and I, I, I don't dispute that. But in the meantime, we're talking of people who are critical, who are very sick, who have, who have no other services, but are dependent on, on the services that is provided by this hospital. So while I don't know and, uh, exactly because there are several accounts as to and, uh, how, how we, we are where we are now, and I think the critical uh, and conversation and, and discussion we should be having is and who is affected most. Okay, Abdullahi Halaki, can you just pick up that point for us out of Washington? I mean, arguably the people of Puntland stand to lose the most here because the people of Puntland wanted the UAE to stay because they're not thinking about hospitals, they're thinking about Al-Shabaab and they're thinking about Islamic State, ISIL, because ISIL is kind of maybe doing what it does. It's, it's had a kicking in Syria and Iraq, more so in Iraq than in Syria, certainly, but it's beginning to want to spread out in other areas. Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, what my colleagues said is that this is going to, you know, bite very critically the most vulnerable members of the community because if this hospital is serving close to 300 people a day, most of them people from low-income areas, women and children, considering the state of the Somali government, that is a definitely very important issue to worry about. I'm, I'm, my concern has, uh, is this level of involvement of United Arab Emirates, it's cutting deals with Puntland, it's cutting deals with UA, um, um, uh, Ju um, uh, sorry, in Somaliland, and, and, you know, cutting out the Somali government because part of the executive uh, is not aligned with it, particularly the president. I think that was where they miscalculated, you know. I mean, that amount of money coming into the country uh, during, like my former colleague said, during a time when there is tension between the speaker of the, uh, and the executive, wasn't an ideal way of going about it, you know. And so, for the UAE now, I think they they also have to be able to be aware that uh, there are ways to go about this. But critically, also for the Somali elite, it's about time that you know. Yes, supports are always con contingent. Aid are always contingent uh, on certain on certain realities. But it's about time the Somali government start providing some of these services. Supports are always welcome. Uh, it's no country can stand on its own, let alone a country that is in a very fragile, you know, post-recovery situation on and off. But I think the critical point is for the Somali government political elite to make a calculation. They would either go with uh, UAE and say that these services will be rendered, and what are the trade-offs? 
or they say, look, we have to look for a different partner or they need to step up because ultimately uh, the main function of government is to provide services. And if the Somali government and the political elite, particularly this administration that, ha that came you know, into power against the background, a tremendous amount of goodwill inside and outside Somali, uh, once they start getting entangled in some of this internal bickering, you know, involving um, you know, some of the players outside, it won't reflect well on their legitimacy as well. Okay, Mohamed Shiri in Mogadishu, would you agree with that analysis? That analysis that says you've got people in Somalia, the voters Absolutely. who, yeah, a, a lot of goodwill based on who their political masters are, but also a certain confusion, a certain resentment. Does it come down to this? Does it mean that the political elite in Somalia, in effect now, have to choose sides? Um, not necessarily. Um, no, absolutely. They, we, we need a bit of clarity in terms of where the, 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 the foreign policy of, of this country is going to go. Uh, but I don't actually share the, uh, the, the point of view that uh, uh, kind of argues that you, you, you've got to side with uh, one or the other. I mean, Somalia uh, could stay neutral. I know it's very, very difficult at the current kind of situation where they need a support. But, but I think they, they, what, what, what Somali government now requires more than anything else is to be neutral, as they say, they're neutral. The UAE are really seeing a bit of shift, uh, a bit of alignment, if, if you like it, whether it's true or not, with the Turks and the Qataris. So the government need to play a, a kind of a, a neutrality and stick to that. Um, it, it's going to be really difficult if it takes sides. Um, if it takes sides now, it's, uh, it's uh, alleged with the Turks and, and the Qataris, then the Saudis, you have to remember here, there is a bigger player that is not coming to the fore with this uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, which has a, a huge interest in this country. But also, can I pick up on the point that uh, the other gentleman said with regards to the who is affected most? We all talk about politics and we all talk about security. But the, the, the fact remains, um, the, the, the poor people now in Mogadishu hospitals that's been closed uh, or suspended, 70%, uh, per, uh, per the point, uh, the, 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 the most difficult here. And equally important is the issue that's been touched upon, which is in Puntulan area, they have an issue, uh, a huge uh, a threat, security threat from my, um, uh, uh, Daesh and, uh, and the rest. So if the support that the government could get from e UAE is, is not taken and, and there's a bit of uh, this issue isn't resolved, then you have all these problems uh, uh, impacting A on the security side and B on the uh, service delivery side, on, on the social service delivery side of, of, of the Somalis. Okay, Mohammed Ali in Nairobi. So clearly up to now, the United Arab Emirates wanted to tickle the cat and play with the kittens. But what was the end point that they wanted to get to? Exerting influence is a means to an end. So what was the end? I mean, my, my assumption is I think uh, and, uh, the intention is to hit the, and, uh, and the Somali government uh, where it hurts most. So that, um, in my view, that they will is try to bend and 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 renegotiate and, and change some of their stand, but I, I think, um, and this should for for the Somali government and, and, and people who who work in Somalia and, and the institutions in Somalia, I think it should be a lesson to to think about in uh, building a local institutions that um, can support and critical and life saving activities, whether the, uh, or and uh, security and other related uh, important uh, functions that the, the Somali government uh, and the community needs. So I think, and well, it is it it, it is affecting and and it is a blow to 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 close the hospital and and uh, and and sort of uh, increase vulnerability in terms of security in Puntland. But I think, and. Uh, it will be unfortunate if the Somali government does not try to, you know, learn lessons from this and maybe rethink and, uh, the rules of engagement moving forward. Abdullahi Halaki in Washington, when they were building the hospital, there was an undertow assumption, and surely it was this. 
Turkey was competing with the UAE for influence and delivering on that influence. And th on the other side of the equal sign was this assumption that said it'll be the people of Somalia who win. Fast forward two years to today, and it seems to me that no one's winning now. And that is the problem, right? I mean, some of this, some of this planning that you do, some of this strategic thinking that needs to go into some of these things are fairly contingent on the, you know, prevailing contemporary reality. The contemporary reality right now is, you know, there are so many people who are angling for influence. And unfortunately, like, like my colleagues said, um, when the two bulls fight, uh, it's, it's the grass that will suffer. And the grass here are the, you know, the, 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 the vulnerable, um, the poor uh, people of the Somalia. And that is why I said, as long as they, they, they lead, I mean, I, I agree with my colleague who said, um, you know, we can play neutral, but you cannot really play neutral in a fairly antagonistic situation like this. Because the, the presidency, particularly when the, you know, uh, Qatari and um, Saudi UAE crisis was, was bubbling, he, he took a fairly, you know, pragmatic, principled position, said, look, we are not taking sides. Uh, he even, you know, said they are willing to mediate. But the reality is right now where things are, the government can play the neutral card, which is the most sensible card that they have right now, considering uh, the position that they are vis-a-vis -vis the reality. But would that, would that retain? Because I must add, you know, it's not just, you know, Qatar, Somalia and UAE. You, you, if you expand the, you know, the horizon, you have Ethiopia on one side, which UAE had to assuage by giving them, um, you know, some percentage in the port of Berbera. You know, it's not just that. You're looking at Eritrea that Ethiopia is always very weary of. You're looking at Egypt that is very worried about the Renaissance Dam that is built um, by, by Ethiopia. So all of a sudden, you're looking at a fairly, you know, multiple levels of engagement that the, Ethiop that, that the Somali government needs to think if it really has any realistic chance of coming out of this unscathed. But, but the critical point is, like I said before, that goodwill that this government had might begin to get eroded when they are, when they are locked in internal political dynamics within the government, okay. when they are pulled in different directions. Understood. Mohamed Shiri, the last couple of minutes to you, please, if, if we can. Are we saying, therefore, that, that the country that will move into this space yes. left vacant by the UAE, apparently walking away, apparently, that the most stabilizing influence might be Turkey? It's very close to Qatar, as we know at the moment. But can Turkey rely on that friendship with Qatar if the GCC crisis clicks into another direction and Qatar starts forming better relationships, say, within the next six to 12 months with the Saudis? Well, I think uh, Turkey plays, very, uh, plays a very important role in Somalia and, and it, um, it had uh, done a, a huge kind of a, a PR, public relations within, within, country, within the country, and you see it's softer power. Um, but, but remember, um, uh, Turkey is also aligned with, with, uh, with Qatar. So if you look at the, the wider geopolitics that's happening, it's going to really, really, really be difficult. Um, I think one, one, one thing one needs to, to remember is that uh, Somalia, and, in the, and, and particularly the government, has been very, very unfortunate in, in the sense that it came to, to a time where there is a huge uh, ge geopolitical game happening uh, within uh, uh, the Horn of Africa. Um, the, the, the ASAP uh, or Eritrea uh, kind of relation with, uh, with Emirates and, and, and the current Berbera uh, that's been mentioned. All this is, is very, very dangerous. What, I mean, in final words, what, what, what I could only say is that the government now needs to stick to this neutrality, but prove it. Action louder than words. Just stick to the neutrality and engage. We, we heard the, the, when President uh, Farmajo went to Saudi, there's been discussions with the Saudis and, and continue that dialogue with the Saudis and, and see if you, can, if you can keep the neutrality and get a support from, from Saudi Arabia in that sense. 
OK, we will have to leave it there, gentlemen. Thank you very much. A quick thank you to all our guests, Mohammed Shiri, Abdullahi Halaki and Mohammed Ali. And thank you to you too for your time over the past half hour. You can see the programme again anytime via the website aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, check out our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also talk to us on Twitter at AJ Inside Story or tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby one from me, Peter Dobby, and everyone on the team here in Doha. Thanks for watching. We'll see you very soon. Bye-bye.